Hello, and welcome to our talk on what does culture responsive teaching mean in an online environment. My name is Dr. Jennifer Banks, and I'm joined with my colleague, Dr. Teresa Matthews. And we are excited to get started um, on our talk today. So we want to start off today by showing you two advertisements that have been out recently. So I just want to give you a moment to look at the ads and think about what you notice, what you feel as you see these advertisements. So as you see on the left, we have an advertisement that says white is purity. On the right, there's an advertisement that says computing performance and maximize the power of your employees. And we see some black males that are in a runner stance around what's perceived to be their boss, who is white. So as we look at these advertising, we have to consider as we begin to talk about the culturally responsive classroom, the fact that our youth, particularly our black youth, are looking at these advertisements on a regular basis. And without knowing that they are ingesting white norms that say that white is pure and that perhaps the advertisement on the right is saying that there is an inferiority or the need to bow to their white counterparts, these thoughts and images are becoming a part of who they are. And so as we talk about the culturally responsive classroom, we have to acknowledge that this is what we're fighting against as we go into the classroom with Black youth and we want them to be empowered. So in that same vein, um, I think it's important to recognize that while students have, have ingested these biases, so have their teachers. And so as a result, um, teachers often engage in practices that create what Dr. Richard Milner, Milner calls an opportunity gap. Um, the idea that, that we're colorblind um, and that teachers don't see color, um, that's just not true unless you really are colorblind. Um, we all have color di differences. Um, and there's value um, in what we bring um, as a result of our different colors um, and result of our different cultures. So um, the myth of meritocracy. So the idea that if you work really hard, um, that you will succeed. Well, that's not necessarily always true. Um, sometimes you work really hard and you will fail. Um, but how do we move past that? Um, that, that whole idea is, is a myth. Um, context neutral mindsets, the idea that we, everyone gets the same thing regardless of the context, um, the recognizing that everyone needs different things, so equality is not the same as equity. Um, we want to create equitable classrooms. Cultural conflicts, um, just those disagreements that occur between teachers and students, um, simply because teachers don't understand students' cultural context um, and cultural backgrounds. And then low expectations. Um, and that kind of builds on what Dr. Matthews just spoke about, the whole idea that we have this image of what a Black person is um, based on these racist um, ads or um, just the way that, in general, our society has portrayed African Americans. And so also the challenges that black students face is a lack of access to high quality learning opportunities, whether or not it's in an urban environment where there are resources that perhaps are not available or in a suburban environment where resources are there and the um, black students are not giving opportunity or access to those materials. We know that overall, um, black students are not having the, uh, the opportunity to engage with the same materials as their white counterparts. Also, they're dealing with microaggressions, these aggressions that perhaps um, they may not even realize are coming to them because of racial bias, not only from their peers, but also from their teachers. And it's the same idea as those ads, these thoughts that are coming into their head that perhaps they aren't at the same level as their peers, or perhaps they don't have um, the same talents and abilities, which we know is untrue. 
So when we think about um, learning online, learning online presents um, both opportunities and challenges. Um, the opportunities include um, they're doing work at home. So they're in a supportive learning environment. Um, uh, for some, it's an ideal place. They feel like they can ask their parents questions um, and there isn't necessarily the competition of others, um, students around. Um, it also limits the number of microaggressions they may experience from their peers, um, as well as from their teacher directly. Is in particular because there's a limited time they're online with their teacher. Um, the challenges include though, uh, what if I don't have a computer or what if I don't have access to the internet? Uh, I know when the COVID pandemic first hit here in Michigan, several districts, um, high needs districts were giving computers and um, internet access, but it took a while for that to happen. So there was a period of time where some districts just gave packets to students. And so th the idea of worksheet or packet learning, um, a packet is not the same as a, a teacher in the classroom that can explain things. And that packet or worksheet learning put a lot of stress on parents to really carry out the learning that they may or may not have and understanding them. So what is culturally responsive teaching? So based on the work of Geneva Gay, culturally responsive teaching is defined as using cultural knowledge, prior experiences, frames of reference, and performance style of ethnically diverse students to make learning encounters more relevant to and effective for them. So it's this idea that the teacher understands has taken the time to learn and know the culture of the students in the classroom and that they're willing to connect the content of whatever subject or grade level that they're teaching to the cultures of the students in the classroom and they're able to take what the students experience on a daily basis inside and outside of the classroom to make learning relevant for students so that they're able to connect the learning. So they're able to connect their experiences at home with what they're learning in the classroom and it becomes relevant to them and therefore more engaging and it's more of an opportunity for them to learn. We know that culturally responsive teachers take the time to ensure that they are empowering their students socially, emotionally, politically, and academically. And they're there and they see that their position is there to be able to validate the student's culture and allow those students to be free to express themselves and also free them from the oppressive educational practices that are present in many of our schools today. So what does a culture responsive classroom look like? Um, a culturally responsive classroom is a classroom where students feel cared for and supported. They're held to high expectations and they're given opportunities to engage in rigorous tasks. Um, students feel that they are competent. Um, they have the opportunity to engage and interact in dialogue. They have a voice in a classroom and they feel valued. They have positive relationships with, with teachers. There are positive relationships between teachers and students. Um, and students are encouraged to take social action um, and promote racial um, equity and justice. And students are regularly exposed to their own culture within their classroom context. So why should the black community demand culturally responsive teaching? So we know that we're not speaking to a group of educators. So why is this so important? And so we have to go back to the very beginning when, um, when there was segregation in America and culturally responsive teaching was the cornerstone of teaching before then. So teachers intentionally engage with the community where they taught they got to know the students, they built relationships with the, the students. Um, the black teachers knew the culture and so naturally they integrated that into the classroom and into learning. And they wanted what's best for the students. They believed that their students could be successful in school 
and they could go on to high school and, and also to um, university, some of our great HBCUs. And so they pushed for that and they went to the parents and they had conversations and they were trusted in the community. So today we know that that culturally responsive teaching promotes academic achievement and interest for our students. However, as the, the teachers prior to desegregation fought for equality for their students and equity in the classroom, which was so deserved, what happened was at desegregation, um, we lost our black teachers. They were fired from the schools that they taught from. And as a result, our students lost that culturally responsive classroom that they needed in their lives. And the new teachers who were white did not have the experience to teach um, the students in a culturally responsive way, and in some cases didn't desire to teach them in a culturally responsive way. And so we know that that caused a lot of problems for our students that continues today. But we know that today culturally responsive teaching is what's best for all students, not just black students, and that every teacher has the power to implement culturally responsive teaching with fidelity. So all black students um, need to have the opportunity to be in a culturally responsive classroom. Uh, we must believe that all students, all black students have, we must believe in black students' genius um, and the power that they bring to the classroom. We must provide opportunities for black students to develop their own historical knowledge about their community um, and how African Americans helped to build up the country that we have now. Um, black students need to, I tend to expand their um, access and knowledge of black people in corporations and in higher parts of our government. Um, sometimes lack of opportunity to see beyond their classroom, we are limiting students. And then finally, we must train teachers to develop their own cultural competence and to engage in cultural responses um, teaching practices. So black students need space to discuss racial injustice. So as we look at what's happening in our nation and the protests, our students need an opportunity and to feel that they have a safe space to not just discuss racial injustice at home, but feel free to discuss it in the classroom. And we need the, our teachers to be comfortable with having that discussion and speaking truth into their lives about the racial injustice that is still going on. So black students should also have teachers that acknowledge that there is this social and political and systematic racial injustice that continues in our country. And at the same time, give our students opportunities to exercise their voice and therefore they'll feel empowered to not just speak up for today and not just speak up for the racial injustice that they see in our country right now, but also feel empowered to determine their own future, to feel that they are in control of making decisions and that they have the power to um, choose their own path. So what can you do to help? Um, one big thing is to participate in mentorship programs, um, to speak truth into the lives of African American youth, um, to share your experience. Um, we all have had the opportunity um, to fight through um, some racist practices. We all have had experience of some sort with some microaggression or some systematic injustice. Um, so just to be, to speak your truth, um, and to share that we, with youth, it's helpful. Um, assist low-income schools in acquiring technology and also be um, a support there. Um, be it mentoring at school buildings or finding grants or school programs, activities that will expose students um, to te technology and STEM programs. Um, invest in programs that educate students about technology. Um, you know, they have the Sphero coding um, robot. Like there's a variety of different programs, but money is a, often a deterrent for some students. Um, and then advocate for high school internships for students of color, um, particularly 
at your corporation, if there's a way to just open stu students' eyes to what can be and what it looks like um, beyond high school is super helpful. So we want to share a brief video with you. And so if you just give us a moment to pull that up. What's wrong with the system? I think the system is operating at peak efficiency. <laughs> exactly what it's intended to do Absolutely. is what's actually happening. Absolutely. Because people are benefiting from this stuff. Uh, like when I think about the cottage industry from the failure of kids of color that has been created, I'm alarmed. And so my thinking is the way that we go into this to get more of us in, when I say us, I don't just mean black males. I mean, anyone who can be an advocate for people of color. Yes. I'm assuming us, but it can't be limited to us because we have to go on with a disruptive mindset. We're doing, just like you said, the system is doing what it's designed to do and we should not be surprised. So unless it's dismantled and, and I mean, it's not in transform, not reform, because reforming something, you just take what is already there and just, you know, maybe, right. The, the, the student has got survived, survived 16 to 20 years yeah. of schooling um, in a situation that doesn't like us, that doesn't love us. Absolutely. And so uh, they Absolutely. graduate thinking, oh, like, we need to go into a situation that's going to... Um, hopefully change because we're the ones that want to change it because we've been through the trauma and then we get into the system and even though it may look different the standards will be different mm -hmm. the text will be different the people will be different but the institution is still pretty much the same thing so you're walking in there you're like you're replicating that trauma but now you're on the other side of the fence thinking oh my gosh i'm actually an actor i'm an enabler Absolutely. for this because of what i am unless we're doing truly transformative Absolutely. teaching for everybody disruption has become like this really ridiculous word that just means chaos. It doesn't mean that. Um, there can be, teaching is disruptive. The idea of leading someone out of something they know into something new is a disruptive process. And so more people have to be willing to engage in a situation that they may have to sacrifice something, uh, whether it be comfort, whether it be just what they understand, so that more people can get involved. There are people right now who are coming from different spaces. They're not, they, they don't have names and faces or whatever, but they're telling me, oh no, but my kid is my kid and your kid is your kid. And equity means that your kid just be over there and, you know, my kid will just be safe from you. Because mm -hmm. I don't like all that. I don't like that village talk. I don't like that talk about us being accountable to each other. I just want to keep my kid safe. That, that speaks to me about this idea of trying to... I guess solidify the status quo that suggests that my uh, that one individual kid has to be better than the other kids and we have to continue with this you know th this mechanism that allows middle to upper class white men to continue to succeed and everybody else follows in, in line teachers are really good and they're at the best when we ask good questions right and when we ask the questions about why we're doing what we're doing the best way to subvert is always to question like ask the questions like, why is it that we have the policy that we have here? How does that affect our kids? Um, or even in, in you know more concrete terms, why is it that all of our honor students, honor students are white? It's a hard thing, um, but if you're not willing, if you think that things aren't that bad because you're doing okay, mm -hmm. then the impetus behind the movement, where is it coming from? <laughs> Like, so, so here's what's interesting to me. And so we wanted to share this video with you um, as we talked about this disruptive mindset and that things have to turn on their heels to not just for educators, but for everyone. So we encourage you to be a part of this process of disrupting the way that you think about schools and youth and education and begin to take part in um, the education system and believe in our students. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I just challenge you to find how will you disrupt?